Make up mine. Team Fortress 2 has a long storied history of rebalancing weapons. While the game hasn't received a significant balance patch for over half a decade, it was well known for making sweeping changes to its vast arsenal of weapons during its first 10 or so years of life. Among these changes, there were a few constants. Certain classes and playstyles tended to be pretty selectively targeted over others, with things like CC, non-sniper or spy instant kills, and movement alterations often being some of the most significantly affected mechanics in patches. There were clear aspects of the game that Valve seem to specifically dislike or view as problematic amongst the game's litany of complex mechanics, and a ton of them were swiftly and decisively changed. However, there definitely were some weapons that seemed to get it worse than others. I don't mean your typical run-of-the-mill bad weapons, either. We all know the sharpened volcano fragment, sun on a stick, overdose, and things like that are bad. We also all know that certain weapons were pretty significantly changed at one point or another. The soda popper, big earner, things like that. That's not what I'm talking about today, though. I want to discuss some weapons that that, through their history of changes, Valve seemed to have a specific, generalized disdain towards. These are weapons that, at any given point in the past, may have ranged from viable to straight-up meme weapons, but through significant mechanical changes became some of the worst weapons in the game. The key thing to note here is intentionality and consistency. A weapon being justifiably nerfed once or twice does not land it on this list. There has to be a clear and marked pattern of heavy, consistent nerfs in a weapon's history, or otherwise being neglected in places that other weapons would probably be given attention. We're only going to be discussing five weapons in this video, as I feel these five for the only ones that fit the bill, but without further ado, let's discuss some TF2 weapons that Valve seems to actively hate. Ah, we're busting out the Steam Gardens immediately, that's how you know this is a real YouTube video. Regardless, the Babyface's Blaster is kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't type of TF2 weapon. With its current mechanics, it's kind of destined to either be horrifically annoying or horrifically overbalanced regardless of what you do, and guess what category it falls into right now. Yeah, this is arguably Scout's worst primary weapon in the game, and I say that with full knowledge of the backscatter and the shortstop. Its primary mechanic is its ability to alter the Scout speed based on the damage dealt and received. The Scout starts out at a 10% movement speed penalty, still comfortably being the fastest class in the game, but noticeably slower than default, and steadily builds a unique boost meter as he deals damage. For each point of boost, Scout gets progressively faster, eventually reaching a huge 173% base movement speed, or the speed cap of the game as a whole, after dealing 100 damage. This is hypothetically very problematic, as making the most mobile class in the game even harder to pin down is not great. This is why Valve saw it fit to really butcher this thing. For one, the Babyface's Blaster's boost is reduced upon receiving damage, and rather than having the boost loss be 1 to 1 with the boost gained from dealing damage, it's lost at a 4% rate, requiring only 25 damage to completely drain a full boost meter. This goes without saying, but there's a lot of stray, unavoidable damage flying around in TF2. On the average 24 player casual server, you're unlikely to be actively participating in fights and not taking small slivers of damage every now and then. It's simply unavoidable. On top of that, you also lose 75% of your boost upon double jumping, which firmly pins an otherwise very agile class to the ground. Now, this should seem fine. You could argue that the massive movement speed increase should offset the lack of an ability to consistently double jump and allow you to easily dodge enemy fire. However, due to the ease of losing an entire boost contrasted against the effort it takes to gain it, fights with the babyface's blaster often boil down to killing a class, gaining boost, having it for a few seconds, and then immediately losing it from a few stray bullets. Anything resembling a flow state or consistent niche for this weapon is almost a immediately torn away as soon as they arrive. For reference, 25 damage is about equal to a single max ramp up pistol shot, two minigun pellets, and only half of a maximum fall off rocket. To put it simply, gaining this weapon's primary positive requires a Herculean effort that can be quickly undone through comparatively minimal effort on the enemy's part. Oh yeah, and it also has two less bullets than the scatter gun. It's clear that this weapon was designed to be a hyper offensive rushdown type of scatter gun, prioritizing speedy hit and runs and killing enemies before they can see you coming. But considering that a few stray sand particles can cause you to lose the entire boost, and that gaining that boost requires committing to and winning at least one fight without taking any damage or double jumping along the way, it's just a bit overbalanced. 
What's funny too is that it wasn't always like this, and the period that it wasn't during was really bad. From 2013 to 2015, the Babyface's blaster lacked the loss boost on taking damage, and only subtracted 25% boost on double jump. This created an inverse problem where it was far too powerful, and a scout using it properly could quickly become the slipperiest thing this side of a Hakan super. The only way for scout to lose boost during this period was to double jump, which made the boost incredibly easy to gain, very powerful, and entirely dependent on the scout screwing up to lose. It made killing a max boost scout extremely difficult, and he kind of just became a persistent pest on whatever map he found himself on. It was so bad that there were even persistent rumors for a few years that a scout with this weapon outran his own hitbox, but these have since been pretty effectively squashed. So eventually, in 2015, Valve made like a boss to a problematic employee and issued a polite yet firm pink slip. Like I said at the beginning of this segment, the Babyface's blaster is in an interesting position because with the boost being designed as it currently is, it's only two states are for it to be either really overpowered or really underpowered. It's the type of weapon that kind of mandates a full rework to be in a healthy position, and I doubt that that's very high on Valve's list of priorities. So while I'd say Valve definitely doesn't like the Babyface's blaster, it comes off as more of a begrudging acceptance that this thing kind of has to be bad for the game to be in a healthy state, rather than a generalized abstract hatred. Keep in mind though that it has been like this for eight years. Unlike the Babyface's Blaster, which Valve seems to have at least a passing understanding towards, they seem to genuinely despise the Righteous Bison. Like, you would think this thing vaporized Gabe Newell's dog with how much they seem to hate it. They get a sick, twisted thrill out of systematically tearing this weapon down, and for the life of me, I really don't know why. The Righteous Bison is a Weta Workshop Raygun weapon, a class of TF2 items that's infamous for being not very great. The Cow Mangler is fine enough, but every other retro-futuristic Raygun in the game kind of lags behind their more conventional counterparts on pretty much every level. However, none of them are really as consistently clowned on by Valve as the Righteous Bison. This is a secondary weapon for Soldier that deals a per tick average of around 24 damage. It fires a slow-moving disjointed projectile that passes through enemy players, allowing it to theoretically hit multiple players in one shot or even hit the same enemy multiple times. On top of that, it has an infinite ammo reserve and cannot be reflected. All of this sounds really great, right? And it's only negative being decreased damage against buildings on a class that's primary Mary is a dedicated building buster makes it seem like a pretty comfortable choice. Yeah, this is one of the worst weapons in the game. For whatever reason, the Righteous Bison has been the target of a continued nerf campaign by Valve. Its damage is absolutely pitiful, failing to even consistently kill unaware snipers before they can react, and its slow and incredibly inconsistent projectile make using it as a combo or trapping tool less than viable at best. Everything this weapon does is done better by other soldier weapons, with its niche as an unreflectable close-range pyro counter being outdone by the shotgun, and its niche as a surprise tool that can hit multiple enemies being outdone by its attachment to a class who has a rocket launcher with splash damage. There is effectively no reason to use the Righteous Bison in its current state, and pulling it out in a fight is often either a self-debuff at best or a throw at worst. And what's really screwed up is that it wasn't always like this. A few years ago, it dealt a more inconsistent yet all around higher amount of damage. It could handily hit the same target multiple times per shot, allowing it to rack up some really big numbers under the right circumstances, and was all around much better. It was still a niche meme pick, but one that was at the very least usable. However, Valve for some reason viewed the weapon as a problem and ultimately hit it with a concentrated beam of very potent nerfs. For starters, its trait of hitting the same opponent multiple times was removed, being cited as a bug fix despite there being an in-game tooltip mentioning it, its projectile was made even slower, and its variable damage was made to resemble all of the half-drinking sodas in my game room. Flat and low. These changes obviously did not settle well with the weapon's small but dedicated lineup of fans, and Valve claimed to revert them in the coveted Jungle Inferno update. So yeah, that was a fucking lie. Despite Valve claiming to revert the changes to the Righteous Bison, it was more of a half-step than anything, and that alongside with a slew of additional changes in the same update, left it in arguably a worse position than ever. I truly have no idea what Valve's beef with this weapon is, as it was never at any point in the game's history viewed as problematic or broken. It was always a funny meme pick, and not a serious threat at any level of play. If you guys know why they hated it so much, please fill me in, I'm genuinely curious. So yeah, the Righteous Bison isn't the reason I chose to make this video, but it's the weapon I walked away from it being the most puzzled by. It's like they're picking on the Cow Mangler's socially awkward younger brother, just kind of bullying something that's not hurting anyone for no reason. I guess it's not so righteous after all.
hey would you look at that it's the whole reason i wanted to make this video if there's any weapons in tf2 that it feels like valve genuinely regrets or would want to remove from the game if removing content was an option it'd definitely be the ulapool caber this has always been the de facto stupid meme weapon in the game arguably even more so than the market garden or frying pan and for some reason valve really does not like it Okay, I can actually kind of understand the reason. The Ulapool Caber is a melee weapon for Demo Man being a stick grenade that he hits people with, exploding on impact and sending both the Demo Man and his target sky high. It deals both explosive and melee damage at once, which often results in the instantaneous death of the target and sometimes the Demo Man. And when mixed with Demo Shields and equipment that can guarantee crits, could lead to some pretty frustrating instant kill scenarios in the right circumstances. Because of this, Valve nerfed this thing through the ground. Nowadays, the Ulapool Caber boasts an unlisted damage penalty, a slower swing speed, and most devastatingly, a slower deploy speed. It's also buggy as all hell, resulting in frequent situations where it'll fail to deal one or both of its types of damage, deal less damage than it should, or all around just not work. This leads to actually using the Ulapool Caber to feel like a half-broken janky clunk fest that could go sideways at any moment. It's clearly designed to be a potent surprise tool, allowing the player to either suddenly strike an enemy with a powerhouse blow as an ambush, or pull it out in a close range altercation for a Hail Mary melee attack. However, all of its stats directly contradict this, with its damage penalty and slower deploy speed making it ill-suited as a surprise tool, and its committal nature making it unsafe to use outside of clear sure death scenarios. On top of this, you get exactly one usage of it per life, as after it explodes, it remains so until you visit a resupply cabinet. During this time, it's left as an incredible incredibly slow, weak pool noodle that can't really confirm kills on anyone. This is straight up one of the only weapons in the game that lists exclusively negative stats in its tooltip, and it doesn't even list them all. The Ulapool Caber is ultimately really, really not worth using outside of dedicated throw meme loadouts on less serious game modes, and even then, its bugs and inconsistently make it less fun to use for stuff like harassing snipers than Demo Man's other melee weapons. This is a weapon that's all around virtually unusable despite how fun and funny it is to use, with its unique combination of four negative stats, a plethora of bugs, and an all around lack of consistency and sense of jank that make it a clear anti favorite of Valves. I understand where they're coming from as a version of this weapon that's really strong or probably do horrible things to the game's balance, but it's like, you guys added it, you made your bed, now lay in it. This one's interesting because it's a weapon that I don't think Valve hates due to anything associated with its balance or stats. Rather, it's the weapon's design and associated legal red tape. The Vita Saw is a melee weapon for Medic that was added in 2010. It boasts a unique mechanic to allow the Medic to maintain a percentage of his uber upon death, with the maximum being based on how many hits the Medic landed with the Vita Saw during his previous life. For every hit, he can maintain up to 15% uber, up to a maximum of 60. This requires actually having the uber when you die, so landing 5 or 6 Vita Saw hits at zero uber and then dying will not respawn you with a free 60 percent it's all around a really interesting weapon concept as in a pub or casual you'll probably be dying a lot as medic so maintaining a percentage of what's inarguably the most important and game-changing resource in the match after a death is hypothetically really strong i'm personally not a fan of designing a weapon around the eventuality of death as it feels more like a safety net that encourages careless play than a real bonus but i can totally understand why someone would like it but you may notice that strange vita saws don't exist even over a decade later and that it's not sold individually on the man and co store, and that it's only ever been in one crate. Very interesting. So, have you guys ever heard of Bioshock? Bioshock is a series of 360-era horror-themed first-person shooters that was very popular in the late 2000s and early 2010s. This is worth noting, as it's also when the Vita Saw was released. In Bioshock, there's an object called the Atom Harvester, basically an oversized syringe that can sap the game's key substance, Atom, from its victims. There's also an object called the Vita Chamber, which respawns the player with a percentage of their health on death. You might notice a resemblance between the Atom Harvester, the Vita Chambers, and a certain medic weapon in TF2 that was released when Bioshock shock was very popular. So, there's a lot of smoke and vague generalities about this, and I'm not entirely clear on what the current standing of the situation is, but the general belief among the TF2 community is that, prior to more recent years, Valve legally wasn't allowed to make any money off of the Vitasaw's existence due to its close association with Bioshock and the potential legal repercussions. This is why it's never been unboxable as a strange weapon, and why prior to 2016 it was never available on the Manco store. It's still only available as a part of the 
the Medic Bundle and isn't sold individually. What's also worth mentioning is that the Vitasaw is a community-made weapon and not an original design by Valve, so combined with the dubious legal situation, kind of gives the impression that Valve uses things existent as a liability within TF2's weapon lineup. To this day, it's the only unique Medic weapon that's not available as a Strange, and I can definitely see Valve kind of trying to push this thing under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist. It's only ever received one significant mechanical change in Jungle Inferno, and has otherwise been kind of forgotten. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we found out at some point that all the Bioshock stuff was total hearsay and conjecture, but based on the information that we have now, it appears as though Valve just kind of cautiously and begrudgingly allows this weapon to exist. At least it's better than Rapture. And lastly, we have the Enforcer. This weapon has had a very interesting update history, with Valve flip-flopping on it so much that you'd think they were Teal Opal deciding on whether or not they like TF2. It's always been designed as a Spy Revolver that's key trait is dealing more damage, but Valve has never been able to conclusively decide on when or why it should do that. When it was first released, it featured a flat 20% damage bonus, but made the Spy take slightly longer to cloak. Its use case was pretty cut and dry. It was a stronger, more aggressive revolver that encouraged the Spy to engage in more active gunfights rather than sneaking around. This design did not stick around though, as a mere year after its release, this was changed to a 20% damage bonus while undisguised, the cloak debuff was removed, and it was given a slower firing speed. This change was also pretty clear. It was done to prevent players from sucker punching enemies out of a disguise with a significantly longer than normal reveal shot, despite the fact that the Ambassador and Diamondback could arguably do just that. Funnily enough, this was also changed a few years later to be the exact opposite, and now dealt 20% extra damage only while disguised. This was a very interesting case of Valve literally reversing a weapon's primary niche and use case, and them effectively doubling back on the intended mechanic of that previous use case. So this weapon went from being a flat damage buff, to a flat damage buff only while undisguised, to finally a flat damage buff only while disguised. The Enforcer is an interesting case of Valve simply not knowing what they want. They could not decide on whether or not they wanted this to be a powerful ambush tool, a consistent damage dealer, or a mix of the two, and spent several updates flip-flopping between the three of them before eventually landing on a weird half-solution that really pleases nobody and leaves the weapon in an odd, semi-usable state. So yeah, once again, it's pretty much my relationship with TF2 prior to this year. So, why does Valve hate these weapons in particular? Well, it varies. For the Babyface's Blaster and Kaber, it makes sense, as a stronger version of them could potentially be very problematic for the game's balance. They have to be nerfed for the game to be in a healthy state while also maintaining their intended mechanics. In the case of the Vitasaw, it was purely due to outside reasons that have very little to do with the game or weapon itself. Valve would go on to add and monetize many more direct reference items, so I'd say this one is retrospectively pretty strange. And in the case of the Bison and Enforcer, there is no reason for Valve to target them so much, as they were never viewed as problematic by anyone at any point. I think this ultimately speaks to the greater challenges of designing a game like TF2. Small changes can make big differences when there's this many variables in play, and some things have to slip through the cracks for the game to be in a playable state. One wayward stat can throw off the entire game's balance. It might be fair, it might be unfair, and it might be puzzling, but it does shine a clear light on what Valve sees as a healthy state for TF2's items to exist in. I find this stuff super interesting, and I hope you did too. This is a fun video to make, and I hope you all enjoyed. Hope you have a fantastic day before during and after watching, and I'll catch you all later. Cheers!